The scripture reading this morning is taken from John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. John 15, verses 9 to 17. And then our sermon passage is 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 to 5. So if you would please uh, turn in your Bibles to those passages. The first in the New Testament, of course. The second in the Old. Again, John 15, verses 9 to 17. That's our scripture reading. And then our sermon passage is 1 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 18, verses 1 to 5. Brothers and sisters, the word of God is about to be read to you. There is no more important thing for you to do right now, and indeed even all week, than to listen to the Lord, to listen to God. Because he is going to speak to you through his word. And that you can be certain. To give your full attention to God's word now as it is being read. John 15, 9 to 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Now turning to our sermon passage, 1 Samuel 18, verses 1 to 5. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Thus ends the reading of God's most holy, inerrant, inspired, infallible word. Let us pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, Eternal Son, you are the author of all scripture. Indeed, it was breathed out by the Spirit as men who wrote it down were born up by the Spirit. We thank you, dear Lord, that it is authoritative for us, that it is, that it is the full truth, that it is all that we need to know how to be saved and to live life as a follower of Jesus Christ in this fallen world. We thank you, dear Lord, that it is sufficient for us And that you have given us the ability to understand it as the Spirit who dwells in us helps us to understand. We acknowledge, O Lord, that part of that process of coming to understand your word is the preaching of the word. And so we pray that your Spirit would superintend this process as well, that he would guide the preaching of the word. And that it would prove to be true. Please, O Lord, be with us now as your word is preached. Bless the ones who hear. Bless the one who preaches, we pray. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. 
Now, if you are a person of a certain vintage, and I won't say exactly what that vintage may be, but uh, if you roughly know my age, then perhaps uh, 10 years younger to 10 years older, then you probably are familiar with a, a very popular song uh, that uh, was uh, circling around in contemporary Christian music in the late 80s and early 90s by Michael W. Smith called Friends. I went to, as you know, public high school, secular high school. I was in a, an ensemble, a singing ensemble, and one of the, the duties that we had as a part of this ensemble was called the Fordsters, and our director was a woman named Susie Ford. It was named after her. Kind of an unusual name, but it worked. And one of our duties was to sing every year at the, at the high school graduation. During the graduation, we'd get up, and the, and the seniors would get to pick the songs that they wanted the Fordsters to sing at graduation. And so for four years, Every year, we sang friends. Friends are friends forever, if the Lord is the Lord of them. I probably could go the rest. I don't want to chance it. It's been a while, but I think it's pretty deeply ingrained in my brain. But you get the point. And each year, with slightly decreasing frequency and fervor, but each year there would be tears shed. The thought of losing these forever friends that wouldn't be with us in high school anymore until the final year, my senior year, I think I was so sick of the song that I don't believe I shed a single tear. Even me, who sheds a tear very easily. All that to say, we think we know what friendship is. We think we understand it. And then we read a passage like the passage today, and we read the, uh, this cycle of friendship that Jonathan and David have in 1 uh, Samuel really the second half of this book. And you read something like this, and if you've had a chance to read our passage this morning already, if you've read ahead a little bit and see the kind of friendship that these two men have, you realize that you don't know what friendship truly is. Friendship for us, for the most part, is transient, it's temporary, it's superficial. Perhaps not completely, and hopefully not for everyone, but I do... I have a grave concern that increasingly in our society, we are more and more friendless. The friends that we used to have are no longer with us. Well, let's begin to look at this passage. And I want you to have this thought in mind, because this passage teaches us, of course, about the friendship that Jonathan and David have. But we know that we cannot leave it there. David is not merely this particular man at a particular time serving a particular and distinct purpose. David points forward to Christ. He is a type of Christ. He was a prophet, a priest, and a king. And so we can't simply let it rest in that historical period, the things that we read in this passage. It has implications for us today. It helps us to understand what the friendship that we have with Christ is like how it should be, and in turn, what our friendship with our brothers and sisters in Christ should be. So I want you to think on this thought as we make our way through the sermon today. Though we were his enemies, Jesus Christ has knit his soul to our souls so that we who are in Christ are his friends. Let me say that again. Though we were his enemies, Jesus Christ has knit his soul to our souls so that we who are in Christ are his friends. I've divided the sermon passage into three sections. The first, a covenant of friendship. The second, the right-hand man. And the third, friends. No doubt those of you who are familiar with that song just referenced, it's going through your head right now, and I'm sorry. But not really. It's been going through my head uh, for the last few days as well. So if I have to suffer it, you can suffer along with me, right? So again, a covenant of friendship, the right-hand man, and friends. Those are the section headers. And so let's look at this covenant of friendship. Now, you, uh, you remember, hopefully, the, the, the context. It's been a couple of weeks. I know that. But let's think back to what happened in the previous passage in, uh, in 1 Samuel 17. Of course, this was the amazing defeat of Goliath. And we saw then that this was not merely a work, an act of this young man, David, that it was indeed, it was in fact, uh, 
a defeat by Goliath by the Lord. It was a defeat of Goliath by the Lord. And you remember that Saul had made promises to his men that if one of them fought against Goliath and defeated him, that King Saul would give that man riches, that he would give that man his daughter's hand in marriage, that he would make that man's father's house free in Israel, which meant that that, that, that man's father and his house, the whole household, would become part of the nobility. And so Saul publicly confirmed who David's father was there at the end of chapter 17. As David stood there with Goliath's head in his hand, and we read in verse 2 of our passage that Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. And so David's period in his life of alternating between being uh, out in the fields at his father's house near Bethlehem, shepherding the sheep and, and going to, uh, go, uh, to Saul's palace and playing the harp for him when he had these fits of, uh, of, of, of rage, those days are over. Saul has him now in, he wants him to be there in front of him. Now, given that Saul was Israel's first king and that there wasn't an official royal palace, not something that had been built in Jerusalem at that time, Saul would not have had a royal court in the way that, that say, the Queen of England does today or has for the past several hundred years. And yet, Saul had been long, king long enough for politics and rivalries to emerge. And so you see this as you read on in chapter 18 and on into chapter 19, that there are all, all kinds of rivalries of the court of the king. And one such rivalry could have been between the heir apparent, King Saul's son Jonathan, and this sheep herder bumpkin David, who somehow happened to slay the giant, and who had now been granted access to the king's court. Now it's true that David wasn't an unknown to Saul. He wasn't an unknown to the court of the king. He had played the lyre in order to soothe Saul during his torments, but his status in Saul's courts was an order of magnitude higher now. His position had been elevated. And so it would have been completely natural and even expected for Jonathan to be jealous of David and to scheme and to plot to bring, down his, uh, to bring about his downfall. Jonathan had every reason to be David's enemy. But Jonathan shows us a better way, doesn't he? Now, since his inter introduction back in chapter 13, Jonathan has consistently proven himself to be more worthy of being king than his father Saul. Jonathan would do amazing, uh, extraordinary feats. And his father would try to take credit for it. But of course, when Saul and his descendants were rejected by God, Jonathan, the firstborn, this, this man who clearly could have been king, he was the one who was most affected. And we haven't heard anything from Jonathan since chapter 14, when Saul made that rash vow, banning anyone from eating anything until evening time, and he had brought vengeance on his enemies. And you remember that Jonathan, not having heard his father's prohibition from eating, he dipped his staff into some honey, and he ate it, and the men around him said, what have you done? And when his father was about to punish Jonathan for breaking this foolish commandment, the people stepped in and prevented Jonathan's execution. And that's the last that we hear of Jonathan near the end of chapter 14 until this morning's passage. There's no indication that Jonathan is present in the passages when Saul was told that Yahweh had rejected him. And so it's possible that Jonathan doesn't know at this point that he will never sit on the throne as Israel's king. But either way, whether he knows or not, he readily, he easily cedes his position to this man, David, because he loved him as his own soul. Now, in David's encounter with Saul following Goliath's defeat, you probably noticed there's something that's, I think, conspicuously absent there, isn't there? Saul never commends David for what he did. And when you read that verse, verse 2, where Saul is telling David he wants him, they're with him. He's not going to let him go back to his father's house. There's something, I think, in the, the undertones of a, a little sinister about what's going on. The author of 1 Samuel, I think, is setting up Saul and Jonathan to be in opposition to one another already in these first few verses of chapter 18. 
As we'll see, Saul retains David in his household. He promotes him to a commander over the army. But already you get the sense that Saul is working from the keep your friends close and your enemies closer playbook. Already, it seems, Saul regards David as a threat. I suppose that even though he didn't know who the next king was to be, he knew that someone else was going to come in and replace him. He knew that he had been rejected and that there would be a new king. So Saul becomes extremely jealous of David, but not so with Jonathan, who above everyone else had reason to be jealous. Instead, as verse 1 says, Jonathan's soul was knit to the soul of David. Now that word that's translated knit in the ESV there in verse 1, it's used over 40 times in the Old Testament. And it's used just, it can mean to tie or to bind. You think of the passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6 where God commands the Israelites to, to, to bind his word uh, to their, their forelocks. Uh, it, it can mean something as, as strong as that. And, and Saul's, uh, or rather Jonathan's soul was bound to David's soul in that way. Jonathan and David experienced an immediate, deep, and lasting friendship. And as one commentator writes, the charismatic deliverer of old, that is Jonathan, Remember, he did do those amazing things, proving himself to be worthy to be king. The charismatic deliverer of old recognizes his peer in the deliverer of today. And instead of being jealous and feeling displaced, he has the greatness to recognize David as his peer at once and totally. In even stronger terms, he loves this kindred spirit. Now, some of you, you may scoff at the idea of there being such a thing as a kindred spirit. Others of you have experienced it. You know what it means. You have, you have experienced that with close friends. You meet someone, and it seems like almost immediately you develop those very strong and deep, lasting bonds. And in verse 3, we read that Jonathan loved David as his own soul. In other words, he loved David as himself in keeping with the second greatest commandment. And we see that Jonathan was willing to do anything for David. He loved David so much that he made a covenant with him, a covenant of friendship, as one author put it. For in his heart he was bound to him forever. And Jonathan's and David's friendship lasted to Jonathan's untimely death by the hands of the Philistines in, chapter, in 1 Samuel chapter 31. And I encourage you this afternoon to read that chapter, to read about his death, and then turn the page to 2 Samuel chapter 1 and read David's lament over the death of his friend and even over the death of King Saul, who had been trying to kill him for years at that point. As a sign of the covenant that Jonathan made with David, he gave David his robe, his armor, his sword, his bow, and his belt. What in the world is the significance of that? It was indeed a sign. Covenants are accompanied by a sign. That's how every covenant in the Old Testament, in the Bible, uh, it works. There's, there's, a, there's a promise that is made, and there's a sign that is given. And if you read on later in 1 Samuel, you get to chapter 20, chapter 21 of 1 Samuel, you'll see that there are penalties if that covenant is broken by either David or Jonathan. What does this sign signify, though? Well, Jonathan here is showing that he is surrendering his position as the one next in line to the throne to David. Even though he wasn't aware at this point that David was the Lord's anointed, no one else knew outside of David himself and the Lord and Samuel, at a subconscious level, he understands that David will be the next king. For the prince the heir apparent to give another man his sword, to give him his robe, to give him his bow, to give him his belt. He was showing to David, Jonathan was showing to David, you are taking my place in my father's court. Now we need to, I think here, delicately stress, and again, read through this the next several chapters when you get the chance. But we need to stress that there is no hint of anything untoward in the love that David and Jonathan have for one another. No doubt many of you are aware that there have been many attempts, there will continue to be many attempts 
by those in our current culture, this, this climate that we're in right now, to read things into this relationship that are not there. The Bible is clear that there are types, I guess, of expressions of love that are not permitted between members of the same sex. And to insinuate such a thing, to imply such a thing, to read such a thing into this text is to demean it, to denigrate the friendship. And it's unfortunate that nowadays that boys have a hard time being friends with boys and, and to express a close friendship and love with, with members of the same sex because of what they may be accused of. Girls have a hard time being friends with girls and expressing that because of a fear of what they may be accused of. Because human nature, sinful human nature, is to read things into what we observe, what we read. To read the sins of the day into what would have been a good and godly friendship in the past. This friendship between these two men was completely selfless. The first act of the friendship was one of selflessness. Jonathan giving David signs of the covenant that he had made with David. And the covenant of friendship between these two men was important because humans tend to break their promises. And their friendship was going to be tested. It was going to be put under a great amount of strain and stress. Jonathan was, after all, the son of Saul who would come to hate David and try to kill David. And Jonathan himself would be on the receiving end of a spear thrown his way. I guess not quite the receiving end, but you know what I mean. And so Jonathan was essentially telling David by making the covenant and giving him his clothing and armor that if he betrayed David, it would be to Jonathan's own hurt. And as it turned out, as we've already made reference to, their lives would come to depend upon the covenant that they had just made with one another. I need to stress this. It is not good for us not to have good and close friendships in our lives. And I think in many ways, technology and social media, it has made it far easier for us to make connections with people. And yet something has been lost through their exclusive use in friendships. There's a difference between making a connection with a person and being true and close friends with another person. And loneliness in our, our day and age, loneliness among uh, those of, of, of older generations, it is a real and true problem. And of course, right now, we're, ex we're experiencing that uh, to a very large degree with what's going on in our country. God created us to be relational. And so it's good to have true friends. And it's not sufficient for us simply to communicate through social media. Right now, while we're trying to figure out what to do as a society, it's better, far better, at the very least, to pick up a phone and to speak to your friends and to cultivate that friendship and to grow it. We are relational beings, in part because we have been created in the image of God, who is himself a personal, relational God. And so it is good to be in relationship with other people. Well, it takes us to the next section of the sermon, the right-hand man. We've already made passing reference to the fact that Saul took David that day and would not let him return to his father's house, as verse 2 says. And this verse, we've said, it, it almost has a sinister feel to it. Even though at this point in chapter 18, we're not aware of any animosity between Saul toward David we're picking up on it. There are hints here. Jonathan was giving to David, but Jonathan's father was taking from David, or rather taking from uh, David from his home. He was taking David from his father, his household. But David had been equipped by the Holy Spirit when he was anointed by Samuel to be king, and the military ability that he displayed against Goliath only grew. It only increased. He only got better in battle. Verse 5 says, And David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people who, uh, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Everyone was impressed by David except 
Saul, as we'll see in the next passage. He was universally regarded in Israel as being a great warrior and leader in battle. Now, my family and I were back in North Carolina a few weeks ago, not this most recent trip when I went alone. We were able to visit the cemetery in my hometown where Kit Carson's grandmother is buried. If some of you know who Kit Carson is. Others of you maybe are not familiar with him. I've always had a fascination with Carson because of a family connection that my family has to his grandmother. And when I was young, I would occasionally go over to this cemetery with my dad or my grandfather to mow, to go around the headstones to see uh, the, the, the headstone of, of Kit Carson's grandmother, to clean up around the walls. There was a rock wall. There still is a rock wall around, around it. And at one point in the 80s, it was pretty dilapidated. And so we would go and pick up stones and put them back in place. But I could not say that I really knew mu that much about Carson until a couple of weeks ago when I had the opportunity to read a fairly recent bio biography about Kit Carson. He was a man who, because of his explorations with John Fremont, Fremont, made him one of the most famous people in America during his own lifetime. While he was still alive, this little outpost in Nevada, the territory of Nevada, was named Carson City. It's gone on to become the capital of the state of Nevada. Rivers were named after him. Boats were named after him. People named their children after him. And by most, if not all accounts, Carson's fame was well-deserved. His appointment to various campaigns and expeditions was met with approval by the general population because he had shown himself to be so capable on so many different occasions. If you knew you were going to be in tight spots, you wanted Kit Carson going with you. And in the late 1840s, books began to be written about Carson in this prototypical action figure role. But Carson himself was illiterate. He couldn't read a word. He couldn't write his own name. He had to sign documents with an X. And once when he was going to try to rescue a family who'd been, uh, who'd been kidnapped by Comanches, he went to a camp where they had been recently held, and he found a copy of this, what we would call now today, a dime store novel. Back then, it was a fairly, a fairly recent innovation. The men who he was with, they read this book around the campfire. And Carson strongly disagreed with the way that he was being portrayed in those books. Well, David enjoyed a similar kind of recognition in Israel. So all of this is to say that even in, in, in less than modern times, in the 1840s, people could become renowned throughout an area. And David enjoyed this similar kind of recognition. It wasn't long after David was appointed a commander over the army that women in Israel began to sing songs about him. And those songs were the trigger for Saul. Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. Despite the fact that Saul would become insanely jealous of David, David proved to be beneficial to Saul because he was beneficial to the nation over which Saul reigned. Saul didn't appreciate this, of course, but everyone else did it. But David's victory in battle meant greater strength for Israel and Israel's king, despite the, the fact that the king refused to recognize it. This takes us to the third point in the sermon, friends. In our natural, that is our fallen state, we want what David had. In our natural fallen state, we are like Saul in so many ways. We want fame, we want riches, we want adoration. In our natural state, we would do the exact opposite of what Jonathan did when he came face to face with the Lord's anointed. And that is because in our natural state, we want to be king. We want to be God. Unregenerate humanity is jealous of God and wants everything that he has. Ultimately, we want to be worshipped by other human beings who were created for the purpose of worshipping the living and true God. And so humankind in its fallen state hates God. I think you know this to be true. This might be a controversial statement outside of these four walls, even in the wider evangelical world. But there is no such thing as an innocent human being. Certainly not in any absolute sense. Relatively speaking, there are people who have committed, committed fewer and less heinous sins. We can think of babies as being innocent in a relative sense. 
But we have to admit the Bible teaches that every single one of us, save one, the Lord Jesus Christ, was born into a state of sinfulness. And that is what makes Christ's friendship with us so amazing. To be born into a state of sinfulness means that we are natural born rebels. It's as if we exited our mother's wombs with our fists raised in defiance against the God who caused us to be born. Even before that moment when we took our first breath, we were at enmity with God. We hated him. And we did not, we would not, we could not take the first steps to reconcile ourselves to God. God did this. God has always been the one to initiate reconciliation. Now it's interesting that David, though he is the consummate type and shadow of Christ in the Old Testament, he's the pinnacle type and shadow of Christ in the Old Testament. It's interesting that he is not the one who initiated the friendship between himself and Jonathan, is he? Jonathan did. And Jonathan is very Christ-like throughout his friendship with David. His friendship with David came at great cost to Jonathan. And so this friendship between Jonathan and David, it paints a picture for us of the friendship that Jesus has with us. And Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 15, verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so, I, so have I loved you. And then he gives them this commandment, Abide in my love. Jesus loved his disciples. He loves us with the same love that his Father loved him. Now consider that for a moment. Jesus has loved us just as his Father loved him. Jesus had given his father every reason to love him. Jesus had done, never done anything, whether in eternity past or during his incarnation, that would cause his father's love for him to waver. His father's love for him was perfect, without reservation, never tinged with dissatisfaction or discontent, as human love so often is. And Jesus says that his love for his disciples is the same. He loves you and me with an everlasting, unending, unwavering love. But how can that be? We get that the Father's love for His Son is unwavering, everlasting. But how can the Father's love, how can the Son's love, how can the Spirit's love for us be the same? We've done nothing to deserve His love. We've done everything that should cause His love for us to waver and to be ex completely extinguished. Make no mistake, brothers and sisters, you and I, we have done nothing to deserve his love. So we certainly have not earned it, and we cannot keep it. We can't do anything to cause God to keep loving us. And this is proven by the verb tenses in John chapter 15. Notice the love of the Father that he has for Jesus is in the past tense. As the Father has loved me. And it is the same for Jesus' love for his disciples. So have I loved you. The love that Jesus has for you is rooted in eternity past. It's not rooted in your faithfulness. It's not rooted in how good you love him. It's not rooted in the fact that you reciprocate Christ's love for you right back to him. Because so often we don't. The love that Jesus has for his disciples extends into eternity past, or as Ephesians 1 puts it, before the foundation of the world. His love went counter to what we deserved. If God looked into the future from eternity past, he would have seen only things that were deserving of his wrath, his judgment, his justice, not his love. You and I never have done anything to deserve the love of the triune God. Because God foreknew that we would rebel against him from the moment of our first breath. And despite all of this, he loved us. And so this is what you need to remember. And as we, over the coming weeks and months, by God's grace, as we work our way through this 
these passages that deal with this friendship that Jonathan has for David and David has for Jonathan, we need to remember this, that Jesus is as loyal to us as Jonathan was to David. And just as Jonathan kept the covenant that he made with David, even though Saul, as a result of it, tried to kill his own son, so Jesus kept his covenant with us, even though it brought about his own death. Because as we know, any covenant has penalties for disobedience. And so we see this even in the covenant between Jonathan and David. Jonathan tells David to kill him in chapter 20 if there is any guilt in Jonathan with regard to his dealings with his father. But in our case, in the covenant that God has made with us, it is God the Son who suffered the penalties for our guilt. We have committed the sins. We carry the burden of guilt. And yet Christ Jesus was made sin. He carried our sins in his person on the cross. All of our sins and our state of, our state of sinfulness, all of it was imputed to him. And he was penalized for those sins. He was penalized for our sinfulness. He was punished in our place. There is a price that must be paid for sin because it is treason against God. And Jesus Christ has paid that price for all of those who are in him, meaning everyone who does, who has, who, who does now, who will believe in him. The price has been paid. The penalty has been paid. And if we are in him, if we have communion with, with Jesus Christ, then we also have communion, we have a union with one another. In Christ, we are able to have friendship with one another in the same way that Jonathan and David enjoyed their friendship. Brothers and sisters, in this moment that we are in, in our culture, and it is a moment, it will not last forever. Praise God, it will somehow, one way or another, come to an end. It's a moment. In this moment in which we find ourselves today, we may have to work a little harder to love one another as Christ has loved us, but we are commanded to do so. It might be difficult for us to overlook some things that we observe, that we witness in other people's behavior. It might be difficult for us not to think that sin is taking place when it's really not. But that's what we're called to do. So I challenge you, I challenge myself. We have to be gracious to one another. We have to be patient with one another. We have to be meek toward one another. We have to be willing to overlook certain things that we think are sin, but we may not know they are. We have to bear with one another. We are in a very difficult time for the church right now. And we need to do all that we can to build up friendships with one another in the church. Because ultimately, in an ultimate and eternal sense, we are all that one another has. And just as Jonathan and David could make this covenant with one another and, and know that it was a covenant that would last forever, their friendship would last forever. Why? Not because they would live forever here on earth. They both died. They're both bones are buried or the dust of their bones are buried somewhere in the ground. They could make this covenant with one another to be friends, this covenant of friendship, because they knew that they would live together forever in heaven. And on the new earth, and the squabbles that we are in the midst of right now, in light of all of those things, they're not that important. Jesus said this, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Because Jesus Christ has laid down his life for us, his friends, we are able to love each other as Jesus has loved us. It is not impossible. 
It can be done. You have the gift of God the Spirit dwelling in you. We can transcend this cultural moment and show the world what true friendship looks like. And we have a picture of true friendship, both in the Old Testament and in the New. We can look at this friendship that Jonathan has with David, and we can look at the friendship that Christ Jesus has forged with us. And we can strive, brothers and sisters, to love one another in the way that they loved each other and that Jesus loves us. You are loved with an everlasting love. And nothing, not even your, not even my sinful behavior can take that away. And that is the good news, brothers and sisters. Because of the fact that we're loved with an everlasting love, we will be able to love one another everlastingly. And that also is good news. It's not the, the greatest of good news, but it's pretty good. So let's start loving each other now. Because we're going to have to love each other for the rest of eternity. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you, dear Lord, that your love was not simply some sort of emotion, but that it took action, that it had feet. Because of your love, your eternal Son added to his divine nature a human nature. He took up flesh and he lived among us. But he lived for us and he died for us. We pray that what Jesus has done for us and what you, O Father, and you, O Son, have done in giving God the Spirit to us, we pray, dear Lord, that it would make us able to love you more and more and to love one another. But please help us. Please guide us by your Spirit and by your Word. Please enable us, dear Lord, to show love and compassion to each other, both in this church and to the wider world. We thank you for what you've taught us today. And we pray this all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.